You're listening to Studio 22. We are here at Studio 22. I'm here with my co-host, Will Meldman, and more importantly, Brian Zerf. Honored to have you, man. It's a pleasure. Thanks, guys. Yeah, really yeah. happy to be here. This is awesome. Yeah. What an un- unbelievable setting you have here, too. So uh, yeah. this is yeah. going to be really successful for years to come, I can tell. If you get bored at any moment, there's a pretty good view out there. So yeah, very sick. can't really complain <laughs> yeah. about that. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, man. But, dude, honored to have you on. You've had an incredible track record here in L.A., uh, in Hollywood, and you've done some awesome stuff. So uh, I think a good way to start would be in the beginning – Kind of, where'd you start? Where'd you? What got you going? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, interesting enough, um, kind of started when I was 13 years old. Um, and for my bar mitzvah, my parents said I can go anywhere in the world as my present. My brother chose Israel, and I chose Hollywood. And the first thing I did when I came to Hollywood is I went to the Universal Amphitheater and I saw Richard Pryor perform, and it it blew my mind. It was, it was one of the greatest nights of my life. Obviously, he's a genius. It was, it was so funny and so inspiring that I came back to our hotel and I told my parents, why would anyone want to do anything else but work in show business? So that's yeah. when my dream started. That is uh, awesome, Off man. of that performance. And then um, I went to NYU. So I went to film school at NYU. My parents wouldn't let me move west At the time, people that were in New York weren't really going to like USC and weren't really coming West. I mean, this is uh, in the late 80s. Mm. And the world wasn't the same as it is today. If you grew up in New York, you you more likely went to school on the East Coast. If you grew up on the West, you more likely went to school on the West. So USC, I didn't really know about it at the time. So I went to NYU and met a lot of really cool people and just came out to LA the day after I graduated college. That's kind of like when I, when I was first starting out here, uh, I went to college to figure out what I wanted to do. I was going to play football, kind of like go, and, and my passion was always film. And then one day, you know, in school, I basically had this list in front of me of what I could do, and there was nothing on there that I wanted to do. I just was like, this is not, this isn't, this isn't filmmaking, you right. know, this so, isn't where it's at. So I literally packed up, packed my bags, and, you know, moved to L.A. that, like, that week, uh, there's nothing else like it. Yeah, I think getting into show business is you, you either, that's all you can do. I, I had no other choices. You know, my parents at one point put me into, had me take tests to figure out what I could do because they didn't know what my talent was. And, you know, that led into becoming a producer eventually because becoming a producer is, is sort of a craft that you either have or you don't have. It, it's, 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 it's something that you, you, you get um, you, you learn a lot by being on a set and you can gain a lot of information because you, you have to know how to actually produce. But what it takes to get it done isn't necessarily a teachable um, skill. It's almost like it depends on your personality type, right? And kind of problem solving. And, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and dealing with difficult it. people and, 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 making, and making the network or the studio or whoever the financial backer is feel taken care of between creativity and business. So you really stand in between the talent and what's going on on the set and making it for a price, but at the same time being, you know, able to talk to talent to make them feel good. And that, that isn't something you can really teach people. You either have that or you don't. You can teach the mechanics, you can teach yeah. budget, you can teach somebody how to become a line producer, but to, to become a creative producer that also understands on budget is something that, uh, you know, is a hard skill to get. And, you know, fortunately, uh, I was able to pick it up. That's awesome. Yeah. Would you say with producing, there's a lot of different types of producers out there, like more creative, more business savvy. Which one would you say you are? Like what percentages? Yeah, I say I'm in a a combination uh, because I'm not a writer. So it's, it's a harder... Your best form of doing this, if you, if you actually are a writer and you have a script or something that you've written that you really want to produce direct, and that is that is a certain skill set. I was a non-writing producer, and it's it's tough because you really have to show value. And in order to show value, you got to make the creative types and the talent understand that how you're shaping the project is going to be beneficial for them, and at the same time, making sure the studio and the network knows that you're taking care of them so you're not taking advantage of them financially. Yeah. Um, you got to find a way to make everyone feel like they're winning. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, one a great example is like a test screening. 
you know, some directors may not want a test screening and the studio wants a test screening because the director really doesn't want to know. He wants to, you know, believe that what he's done is perfect. And it, it's convincing the director that he's going to learn a lot from an audience and at the same time not making him feel like you're selling out to the studio that's trying to change his project um, just for, you know, financial reasons. So it's a real balance of how you talk to artists and how you talk to uh, business people. And it's a skill set that, uh, you know, is, is the most important in producing, in my opinion. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, because there is te there is a formula of, you know, we know what do does well in the box office. You know what does well in TV and film, that what the audience going to receive, right? So that makes it a better project. But then you get the creative director who wants to make it its own uh, and maybe not play into that as much. So, yeah, it's kind of crazy to hear that, Uh how intense it is. And I know you know, Will, right? We're producing the resort Well, too. and then you have, you know, directors like Scorsese who can, you know, get a yeah. four-hour cut from the network, right? So it's like you kind of earn your way to get more and more in your film. It seems like it's like and, the better you are, the longer. And then at the same time, you know, and I don't want to name names, but even some of the most famous directors lose their way because they stop listening to the audience because they believe that they're right. Yeah. And it takes a strong producer to discuss it with them and get them into a place where you're really putting out the best product. Because really what a producer is, and, and why I don't like manager producers per se, because manager producers are there to protect the talent. So if, if you're producing, when you, and let's say you manage a big star and you get put on a project, your goal is to protect that star. My producing skills have always been about protecting the project and doing what's best for the project. And sometimes that is about the star and sometimes that's not about the star. But if, if your bread is buttered by the star, you're going to make decisions based on just the star, not on the overall project. So, you know, I'm one of the rare, I'm not rare, but I've been able to last in the industry sort of going from project to project without making it about, oh, I'm partnered with this one star and that's how I'm going to make movies for him. Uh, I, I, I look at it as a total uh, package. I love hearing that because that's like really the teammate mentality, right? Like it's about the team and not one player. Correct. Yeah. And, and, and it can get very confusing because a lot of times the star becomes the most valuable thing and people are scared to tell that star, you know, what to do or, you know, how to promote or, you know, how it could be different. And whether it's the director or the actor, it, it really depends. Right. But, um, you know, I really try and stay in the middle and balance the whole thing. And I consider it more like dating than being married. Was it more like you went to school and studied for a long time or did you dive right into No, I, I didn't singing? really study in school. School was just a means to get to an end, yeah. to get to Los Angeles. So, and then, and then there is no playbook when you get here. You know, this is not an industry where you're going to get, you know, a playbook where if you, you know, you're at Goldman Sachs and you, you do this work, you do that work, you're going to keep moving up the ladder. It's not like that in show business. Um, you really have to have a tenacity. You really cannot be afraid of rejection and you really need to keep going against all odds because when you're putting something together, especially in the beginning, statistically, it's not really a good investment. Now it can become a huge investment, but until you've built a track record, it's very hard to get stuff off the ground. Yeah. Um, it's definitely good to be passionate when it comes to this industry because it's, yeah, it's uh, what they saying? There's like a million things that have to go right and 2 million things can go wrong with a film, you know, TV. Exactly. So you really got to believe in what you're doing and not take no for an answer, but also know how to not bother people too much too. So there's a real skill set to getting what you want, making everybody feel good, and at the same time uh, being on it. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm very responsible in, in the sense of if, if, you, if you need something from me, I'm always going to get back to you. I'm not one of those people that uh, doesn't take calls. I'm always willing to listen to whoever now, if, if you can't deliver, I won't keep listening to you. But uh, I'm certainly open and uh, receptive to all ideas, and you never know where the good ones are going to come from. Exactly, yeah. Were there any uh, crazy obstacles starting out, anything that kind of maybe was discouraging, maybe on some of your earlier projects or just any project in general? I mean, there's always been, you know, like when we did Ray Donovan, uh, for example, one of the things I, I, I do find is, this is a real important tip, is always to try and find executives when they take over studios or networks that are new in their job because they're building a slate. And so once they've built a slate, it's very hard to get in there 
because they're they're working on the stuff they've developed. So Showtime was a good example where David Nevins was a was a producer that went over to run the network. And, you know, we had wanted to be at HBO at the time, but HBO had a ton of projects going on. They were the hottest network at the business. And Showtime was, you know, David was putting his his slate together mm. post Greenblatt. So when I, I do find it's important as a producer to understand the landscape of the business so you know where you're placing projects to have the best chance of success. So sure, we would have been better off at the time or thinking HBO was better, but really Showtime was the right place for us to be because David was building his slate. Um, and uh, that was uh, that was really important to the to the success of that show. Is there a way to, to find out like that? Like for a producer just starting off, like someone in my position, like would you, you know, read articles and try to find out how people are shifting around in the executives? Yeah, that's why I think it is very important that you are reading Deadline Hollywood, you are reading Variety, you are reading Hollywood Reporter. Like you need to make that every day. Yeah. You know, you don't think it's important, but knowing who the players are and where they are and what they're doing is really important. And, and trying to stay one step ahead of that curve is, is an art in itself. And obviously agents can help you, but you, I never like to rely on anybody to do anything. Right. Um, I think, especially in today's world, you know, more so than when we first started, I do think agents were more valuable, you know, 15 years ago or even 10 years ago, even five years ago, because you, you weren't able to reach talent directly. Now, at least at the position that I'm at, if I reach out to somebody, whether it's sometimes it's even through DM or people reach me through DM, weirdly, you're going direct to consumers. So it's following the same path as other businesses. Um, I mean, back in the day, you would never reach out to a star. I mean, what, are you going to call their house? At dinner? <laughs> I mean, they're, it's going to be crazy. Um, you'd have to call their agent. But now you can call them directly. And and if you can make those relationships, and I'm not telling you to avoid agents. You, you, the agent should be negotiating the contracts and doing the deals. But you shouldn't be afraid to reach out to talent and try and figure out stuff on your own, directly to people with good ideas. Everybody's on Instagram now. You can reach people. Right. So I think there's more opportunity now than there was when we started when you had to be sort of in the cult of right. Hollywood. And that was a that was a tight knit club that if you didn't break, you were never gonna get in. Mm. Now I think it's wide open. Yeah. And there's even more platforms than ever and more places to put content, right? So I feel like Exactly what you're saying. We're actually in an age where it is easy because I've had so many relationships, friendships, stuff that all started from social media. I mean, I, I even started on social media to get here, you know, and I saw that, okay, build a brand that's going to help you grow more and get, and then it opened my first doors. And, you know, now I'm sitting here, you know, we're a hundred percent. I mean, yeah, listen, yeah. I do it on a small scale for myself. I don't have that many followers, but you know, I have a, people can find me. And, and for example, recently I posted something that I was with somebody, somebody super famous and then an incredible idea came to me to bring to that person because they knew I could get to that person. And so somebody bought me incredible. I brought it to that huge star and he's loving it and we're putting this deal together. I don't, I can't really talk about that one specifically because it's, you know, it could still fall apart, but that's how quickly it can happen. So I do think like avoiding social media, avoiding doing podcasts, avoiding getting yourself out there is a mistake too. There's, as long as you're putting out good work and, you're responsible and, and you're, you're not using social media with some sort of political message or anything ridiculous. If you're just looking at it to, you know, how you can connect people and how you're, you know, in the know and in the action, you are going to get, I mean, I'll give you a great example on, on the match. So I, I do the golf thing with them. Um, I, I can use this one as an example. A huge brand reached out to me, a, a new, an upstart um, electric vehicle company reached out to me because they knew that I was, yeah, I do the match, immediately connected them to Warner Media, And now it looks like they're going to be the number two sponsor on our next match. And it's all because on social media. Now I brought that deal in and I'll, I will benefit from that because I'm bringing that deal. Now, listen, I control the project. So, you know, it, I can do that. But the point is you can use social media to your advantage now, which I never had, which we never had. So everything is accelerating faster. So what took, a, a sort, of, sort of a 20 year trajectory from when I moved out here from, you know, 22 to like 40 to get things going. Like it can happen a lot faster now because yeah. people can connect the dots on, on what you're good at. 
Yeah, like I feel like, like you said, it used to be more of a cold, hard to get in, impossible if you're not in it, you know. And then now it's okay. It's open, uh, fair, fair play. It's open game. And if you're not doing that, though, like I, even from from an actor's perspective, it used to be so amazing when an actor would come out because you didn't hear from them for however long, and then all of a sudden, boom, they're there. You want to go see their movies, see their films, see what they're in, see what they're doing. And anytime you hear gossip or you know news or whatever it is, you're engaged. Now it's like if you're not doing that. I feel like you're getting forgotten or, you know, you have to do all of these different things and stay connected as much as possible. And, you know, I've gotten almost the majority of my deals through reaching out to people, through connecting, through, you know, reaching out to brands as well, you know, people I want to work with. And I'm like, you know, even, I mean, this watch I'm wearing, I got just because I hit up the company and, you know, they're, they're, they're right. awesome about it, you know? Right. So, I mean, you have to take, being a producer is about taking things into your own hand and making stuff happen out of nothing. It's not like we're saving lives. So regarding the match, was it a hard switch to go from, you know, like a controlled studio vibe into a large scale uh, live event? Yeah, no, it was definitely a learning experience, um, but it took a lot of the same skill sets. Dealing, you know, I hadn't dealt with athletes before. I just dealt with actors. I'd done Ray Donovan, War Dog, Steve Jobs. I'd done these movies with some really, you know, big actors. And Ray Donovan, I was on the set every day for, you know, four years took that concept from article that off of Anthony Pelicano and turned it into a TV series with Ann Bitterman. But that was about finding an opening in the marketplace where The Sopranos was off the air and Entourage was coming off the air. So I, I, was, I wanted to make a hybrid between Sopranos and Entourage. And that's how I went to writers. That was my pitch. And that's how I ended up developing it developing it with Ann Bitterman. Similarly, the match, I was a big fan of the skins game when I was a kid. It all goes back to childhood. You know, like I talked about, you know, Rich Pryor when I was a kid. Also, when I was a kid, we, we'd come to Palm Springs to visit my grandparents and the skins game would happen in Palm Springs. And I was like, oh my God, that's such a cool thing. You'd have the big, most famous golfers playing in sort of a celebrity type cash game setting. I thought that was super fun. And that ran for 20 years and then and then it didn't. Um, I had made a relationship with Phil Mickelson actually through the Madison Club and we'd become pretty close. We were friends, we were playing golf together. And this is a great example of relationships. And so we had built a trust and I woke up in the middle of the night, Tiger Woods had just... Um, come back on tour and fill one in Mexico. And this was in 2017, 18, 2018. And, and that's what happened. And I woke up and I said, I, I called Phil up and I was like, look, I want to talk to you about this idea. And he was, you know, into hearing what I had to say because he had known I'd done some good TV shows and we had this great relationship. And so he was like, wow, that sounds amazing. And so but it really was about reaching out to talent, not being afraid to pitch an idea. And it was very similar. It just was a different setting. I just had to meet the different players in the sports arena. And once I got to meet them, that was where, at the time, my agent CA was very helpful because they were big in sports. So I was able to take my theatrical team who introduced me to the sports team, and then they put me in, in a good position with uh, the Turner team. And then I was able to build my relationship with the Turner team from there. And interesting enough, you know, it's so funny when you get into different aspects of the business, the sports guys always want to hear about the movie and the TV stuff. And the TV <laughs> guys always want to hear about the sports stuff. So you can use that to your advantage because everybody's always interested in something they haven't done. And so as a seller, because as a producer, you're really just selling. So, you, you know, at least to get the thing off the ground. So, for, so from a salesman salesmanship point of view, that actually, I used it to my benefit. And that's where producing is a skill that you can't teach. You have to understand that. So when you walk into a room, you can use your, the assets that you have to make people feel comfortable about what you're going to bring them and then add value so that you, you have value within the project. Does that make sense? That's incredible. Yeah. Makes great sense. Yeah. I, uh, what about more of like a physical production side? Was that, yeah. do you have a good team on that? Yeah, so very similar. Good question. Um, that comes down to like a line producer. And so 
you know, we we had a we have a great partner who's really good at that, similar to what I had on Ray Donovan. And I'll, you know, if if line producing is not going to be your thing, as a producer, you really want to make sure you have a core group of line producers that you trust because they save your butt. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because a lot of problems are going to happen. Things fall back on you because it's your reputation and your name. So you better know that the person that's you know hiring all the vendors is knows what they're doing and going to do it responsibly and you know and uh, responsibly financially to make sure you look good, but also give you great vendors so that your stars and the people around you also know you're working with the best people. And just for the audience, a line producer is someone that takes it, puts it out over time, budgets it, right? Yeah, Very the line producer is really yeah. dealing with each production head. So you're dealing with the art department, the reporting to him with the financial issues. You're dealing with all the different departments report to the line producer, and he's dealing with the physical production aspect. And as a creative producer, you're dealing with the show and dealing with the talent and making sure that they're feeling good about what they're putting out there and you're dealing with the studio and sort of managing all of it into one big uh, pot. And, you know, eventually it all falls on you, so you better make sure everybody around you is accountable. Absolutely. So do, uh, do you sleep when you're working on a project? I don't sleep in general. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. So, so I actually think, you know, the best work is done early in the morning. Yeah. Um, and I think now with phones... Um, it's much easier to read. And I'm crazy. I mean, I'm reaching people at six in the morning. Like, I feel like if you're not up at six in the morning making stuff happen, then you're missing out. Because that's when your mind is fresh, especially as I've gotten older. So, you know, my mind is fresh. And, and I know I can reach people like me creatively at that time because between six and eight, I get a lot of stuff done. If I'm, if I'm sleeping past five o'clock, then that's really late for me. I'm up, I'm up about 4.45 every, every day. Every, every day ready to, you know, fire. And one of the things for me as a producer, different than maybe a lot of people, I'm very responsive. If you ask a question or you, yeah. you're concerned about something, I get right back to you. I feel like you're at the center and I don't like people being left out there feeling bad. I mean, I hate it when I reach people and they don't get back to me and then my head starts spinning. I, I want to know. And if it's, if it's like screw off, it's screw off. I don't really care. But I will keep going until I get them to tell me no. Or at the same time, I want people to feel like I'm there for them so that if there is a problem happening, you know, it's being dealt with right away. Yeah, I'm very much the same way in that sense of if there's something on my mind, I just want to get it done as fast and as quick as possible, but efficiently um, so that I don't, it's not on my list anymore. You know, I exactly. can move on to the next thing. Um, exactly the same way. Or else I'm thinking about that thing. Yeah, and I do the same thing and it, all, it becomes becomes obsessive. It's like, okay, well, it's like, you know, it's as simple as like not doing the dishes. You know, I think, you know, we were talking about that the other day. Um, but it's like, if it's there, it's still going to be in the back of my mind all the time while I have to do all this other work stuff, right? But then I, it's, it's the same thing for me. It's get that done, get everything done, get it out of the way, move on to the next thing. And, and that's, I feel, keep pushing forward. And then back to your, you know, uh, waking up early. I've always had like a crazy sleep schedule for, for different reasons. You know, I used to love to sleep in. And in the past couple of months, actually, I started getting up at either 5 or 6 a.m. every morning. When I tell you my productivity has quadrupled and just the way I show up and getting things done, it's unbelievable, you know? And, and I've done that before, like in kind of waves. Now I'm like, no, this is my routine. This is what we're doing. Well, because because yeah. in the morning, you're, you got an empty slate. Yeah. By four o'clock in the afternoon, you, you're putting out fires. You're dealing with everything. That, I don't want to hear about it, like at the end of the day. So I like to start the day, get my stuff out there and get my answers and get stuff moving every day. And I try and set up like a board, a whiteboard to say, I want to accomplish this this week. You know, I got to get, for example, I'm working on this new deal. I got to make sure by Friday that I get a date cleared where all the talent is available and then figure out with the venue. But th this, yeah. this week, my goal is by Friday to know that my date is good. And mm -hmm. so I'm working every day towards that. So I think you have to set yourself goals for the week and, and they don't have to be that big. They can be, because it's little accomplishments that, you know, a film or a TV show or a sporting event, it's just a puzzle. You're just putting that puzzle together. For me, the, the early morning stuff, I think has really changed my whole perspective on, because, you know, when you get to 11 o'clock and you've done more than most people have done in their entire day, it's a great feeling. Exactly. You know what I mean? And I'm, I'm very much that I love, and I know Will is also like this, where it's a puzzle piece where, okay, how do we make this fit? 
even when it comes to matching talent, people, you know, like I, anyone I introduced you to, I'm like, okay, well, this is an extension of me because if that person's crappy and they make your life, you're going to view that it's going to come back to me in some way, you know? So I'm making sure to surround myself constantly with good people. And that's what producing is surrounding yourself with good people and talented people to create a product that you think people are going to like. I kind of wanted to shift gears back sure. to Ray Donovan real sure. quick, if that's okay. Yeah, of course. Um, it was canceled on season eight, I believe. Seven. Seven, relatively abruptly. Sure. And there was a, you know, an outcry from fans because it was essentially on a cliffhanger ending and Correct. they wanted to see what happened. And, you know, there, were, there was some outrage in the fandom. Um, but then the film came out January 14th. Do you think the film kind of gave it a good cap on the series and how was the reaction from fans on that? Yeah, so I think it gave it a great cap on the series. It was definitely something that we needed to do and I think it would have been very disappointing if the network didn't finish it off. You know, but what happens is you get into a seventh year of a show. You have, the show is called Ray Donovan and, you know, Leah has killed himself for this show but, you know, he's made a lot of sacrifices in his personal life and, uh, you know, that takes an effect on the entire cast and, and the network and, you know, so things happened to put us in a situation where they abruptly did what they did, but we quickly realized that we needed to rectify that or Showtime would have had a lot of unhappy customers. So what we've decided to, what we did was we set out to make a movie and I do think it worked. And the ending was the backstory that Ann and I had worked on for, for years to create the series. So I do think we needed to get that story out and hopefully the plan is now to make a movie every year and and make sort of a new model where instead of which is great for Leah if potentially if we can pull this off. And I'm not saying any, I'm not saying we're doing this, but this is what we're trying to do. If we can make a movie every year, that could be really successful for Paramount Plus and very successful for our actors because it's not as uh, time consuming as doing a full series but it can give the fans something to look forward to every year. So I'm hopefully we have figured out a way to do that. So we're working on that. I don't know if we'll accomplish that, but another thing that producing is, is making sure you have a lot of things out there because you never know which thing is going to happen. So um, our intention now is to try and make a movie every year. I mean, I'm sure the fans would be ecstatic to hear that. Um, it's interesting too, how like real life, issues and problems kind of come into it as well in terms of you can change, you can shift the medium and still accomplish something for the fans, right? <laughs> like a TV show being that time consuming, but if you switch to a film, like I love hearing that because like you said, that's like a part of the big puzzle, right? Right, because it's going to be hard to get Liev to do something now for six months and sacrifice not being with his kids or you know being away from where he lives for eight years on a television series yeah, i mean that's it's a very grind. understandable people yeah. don't understand what a grind it is to make a show is as you get older your life gets complicated there's more people in your life and you know working those long hours is tough i mean the good news is most people who do show business whether it be acting or producing they love what they do so they don't really think of it as work so they do want to be there but things happen in life and um, you, you got to make sacrifices. So we have to figure that out with the talent. And that's what producing is. Amazing. One of the things that it is. Yeah, so it's a lot of things. You've worked with incredible talent and uh, I'm curious to hear what it was like working with, you know, Todd Phillips and Aaron Sorkin. Sure, I'll start with Todd Phillips because I worked closer with Todd. Mm. Aaron was more a situation where I got the rights to the book. And then when we handed it off to Aaron, he kind of took that over and he did his thing. Uh, Todd, similar, but I was very close with Todd. I had a really good relationship with him. I read an article in Rolling Stone magazine called Arms and Dudes, and I optioned that article for not a lot of money. And I sent it to Todd because Todd was just coming off a hangover, and I knew that he could pretty much do anything he wanted to do. And he was looking to do something that had a still touched sort of a young sensibility, but at the same time was elevated. Um, and so I, I knew it would appeal to him. And that's another thing, knowing what directors are looking for, knowing what's going to appeal to them. And you can't just rely on the agent to tell you that. You have to have these direct relationships. And thankfully, I've had that relationship with Todd for 10 years. So when I went to him, he knew I had good taste and he knows I don't call him unless it's something he may like. So that's another thing 
about producing, whether it be Aaron Sorkin or Todd Phillips to tie them in together. When you do reach out to them, you want them to take your phone call knowing that they're going to pay attention to what you're telling yeah. them. So you don't want to just be flying stuff against the wall. You really have, an, have to have a taste and an understanding of, of what you want to accomplish. And if you have that, you have a good chance of, you know, talented people saying yes and wanting to work with you. But if you're constantly annoying them with stuff that's bullshit, you're just going to get, you're, you're just going to be thrown out of town. So I, I find that to be one of my arts for me and my skill set. Um, you know, people, you know, you know. Yeah, yeah, you can read a room. Yeah, exactly. And, exactly. and you know what people want. And that, that leads itself into the art world, whether it be modern art, which I collect, contemporary art, or, you know, where I think tastes are going, where, where I think, you know, the world is heading and it goes into movies, it goes into sports. So producing isn't just one thing, it's a lot of things. And you can carve out your own niche if you know who you are and know what you're good at. And if you know that, it doesn't feel like work. Like, I don't feel like I'm working any day. I feel like when I wake up in the morning, I am ready for action. Yep. And, there, and again, I, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but uh, there really is no one-way blueprint how to do it out here. So you really have an unlimited amount of avenues and, and ways you can get something done. But as long as you get it done, you're on the right path, right? Exactly. You don't know what your path is going to be. Like, look at Logan yeah. Paul. Look at those guys. Like, yeah. they were on Nickelodeon shows. Like, and then they've turned themselves into something different. Now, whether you like it or don't, They've chosen a path and they're going for it and now being very successful in that path that they've chosen. But there was no blueprint to get them from a Nickelodeon show to who they are now where they're fighting Floyd Mayweather and putting up numbers that are as good as any fight in history. Now, I'm not saying that's getting good reviews. I'm not saying that's what I want to produce. And I, sure, but I'm saying how what he's done is his way. So I'm yeah. used to using an example of doing things your way. And if you do things your way, you will be you will be happy about the life and the choices that you make in your life and you won't have regrets. It won't be about, oh, I should have made 10 million more here or 2 million more here or I wish I'd, you won't have regrets because you do it how you want to do it. And that and that's kind of how I live my life or else I wouldn't have gotten into show business. So if, if you want to get into show business, you have to do it your way and you have to do it with a lot of passion and, or you might as well go get a job as an investment banker or a private equity person. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I worked at this job, uh, before I ever moved to LA, it was a junk hauling and moving company. Right. And I remember the first day I hired my brother, um, we went to this, this house and he didn't want to be any part of this project. Uh, cause it was like 20,000 spiders. It was ridiculous. But I was like, <laughs> I said, I'm gonna get it done. I'm gonna get it done. Anyways, the guy that whose house we were doing is the older gentleman, uh, was a professor. And so I was like, oh, this could be a teachable moment, you know? Like, uh, so I asked him, I was like, do you have any advice while we're signing the check, you know? Do you have any advice uh, that you can give me and my brother? And he said, uh, bring your own uniqueness into the world. And ever since then, I'm like, and then he also, he gave us two pieces of advice. The other one was be true to thine own self. So between those two, I was like, wow, those, you know, when you really think about it, and especially the path that I want to go down, uh, when I first came to LA, I started off with modeling and I'm like, this is just not me. And everyone's telling me to stop working out, stop doing this, don't eat, cut your hair, do whatever. Yeah. And I'm like, the reason I got any notoriety whatsoever in the beginning was because I didn't do any of that stuff because I was myself. And back to like Logan Paul, um, I just saw him and uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, doing a podcast and he was saying, I love what you guys are doing. You know, Arnold was telling him because you're like me, I paved my own path. Great example. Arnold and Stallone are two phenomenal examples that go back into the 70s and, and early 80s when, when they became super successful. They did it their way. It was a new mold. And, you know, it's similar to the art market, it's similar to like Andy Warhol choosing a different path or Ed Ruscha doing something different. It opens up a door to everybody else. And, you know, Arnold and, and Sly opened up incredible doors for people. And then, you know, it's about finding your way and then opening your door and knowing that media is changing. So, you know, had Logan Paul been an actor in Schwarzenegger's era, he'd be more like an Arnold. He'd have to sit with trying to become a more of a, you know, an action star like that. But, you know, he did it his way and, um, you know, all the more power to him. Yeah. And I mean, same thing with networks too. Like you've seen Netflix came in, everyone, it felt like they were against it. You know, now everyone has a streaming platform. Exactly. You, know, you have to move with the times and be able to adapt and adopt. Uh, in order to thrive, to only survive, you know, one, but also to thrive in this industry, I feel. 
you know? You got to be willing to take chance, take risk, and not be afraid to fail. Yep. I think there's something absolutely magnetic about, you know, being true to yourself and self-actualizing. I think Brock has an extremely unique path as well. And I, you know, I learn more about it every day, honestly. But, um, you know, it's a great example. Man, I'm just having fun at the end of the day. Like you said, I'm, I'm passionate about this, this industry. I love it. I don't feel like I could ever get burnt out on it, you know. Um, obviously, there's, there's hiccups, you know, working with certain people or uh, doing big productions, trying to get things rolling and, and going. But there's always going to be that, you know. It's, it's how do you show up to get, a, get it done or how do you get to the finish line? It's, for me, it's if that door closes, okay, well, then that's not the door I'm supposed to go down or maybe I'm supposed to kick it down even harder. But if it's not... There is an unlimited amount of, possi- amount of possibilities I can go this way to go make sure it gets done, you know? It's like even little things, when we were doing, shooting the resort, for example, it's like there are little things that each person added value. And so whether it was changing the scripts on the spot or even, you know, helping with such a big thing, we had a, you know, a little indie film, but... The resort Everyone 2021 doing, available yeah. everywhere on demand. There, there you go. go. <laughs> there you go. But and on Netflix, right? Didn't Netflix pick it up? We are Hulu, Amazon, Apple, DirecTV, all the. Oh great! Not Netflix. Basically. Oh no, no, yeah. sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but maybe they'll uh, hear maybe this. Maybe they're here now. <laughs> Come on, Stu. We should you be. Gotta do this. Yeah, right. But yeah, man, it's just uh, having a good time, and then and then you get to make relationships. Like I'm so grateful that you know me and Will have not only become great friends, but also gotten to work together and his passion mixed with mine, you know, mixed with so many great people that we get to work with and, and the goal and visions we have too. It's, it, it only makes it that much better, you know? Listen, it's really simple. Surround yourself with good people that have share similar passions. Don't get caught up with bullshit, drugs, alcohol. Those are not winning. No, nobody wins doing that shit. So uh, if, if you're around good people that every day are trying to make something happen, things are going to happen. Absolutely. I mean, it really is one of the simple rules in life is surround yourself with good people and you will end up having good things happen to you. Or, and I, don't, and I don't just mean good people. I mean, people that are good, that are striving to do stuff. Ambitious. Uh, ambitious. And, you know, wake up and do, that's why I'm up at five o'clock in the morning, figuring out what problems I'm going to solve every day. Yeah. I was going to say, if you want to do that, you got to wake up like BZ at 445. Exactly. <laughs> I think exactly. you and Wahlberg are the only yeah, two people up. up. Too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm up. You can call me anytime. If you want to reach me, five o'clock is the best time. Yeah. I do put the phone down though at 930. So I okay. do, I do find you. So between like 10 o'clock and, um, you know, 445, I do shut off. So I do think that is important too. You can't always be on. And I know that's not a big period of time to not be on, but I do not sleep in my room with the, with my phone. I, it's, it's, a, it's actually my one time that I do find sleep is important. So even if I'm getting six or seven or five hours, I want it to be a really good six, seven or five hours. I'm not checking my phone in the middle of the night. I do turn it off because, um, you know, I'm at it right away when I get up. There's a great book, The War of Art. And it's essentially about a writer who their most productive hours were 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. And every single day they would work in that time slot. And they figured out what worked for them. And they got tons done. They wrote books and now they're successful. And, you know, it went from nothing to something through focused, determined hard work in like a allotted time period. Exactly. Yeah. If you have that and, you, and you're passionate about what you want to do um, and you have good taste, the most important thing for producing is honestly taste. Uh, and and that, that rubs up in all aspects of your life. Um, choices about who you marry, choices about where you live, choices about how you raise your kids. All those things are based, are, are very similar skill sets that go unnoticed, um, but they all come together to form the type of taste and choices that you make in your life. And those are the things that, um, you know, people rely on when you're a producer that you're, that you understand that stuff because that's what people are, you're, they're buying your product. So you, 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 all aspects of your life should feel like um, everything you do is, is, is taste and quality. Yeah. It's a, it's a full picture view instead of just a slight, you know, a little sliver of it, but you can see probably the, the whole picture better than a lot of people. And you realize that when it comes to sleep, you know, nutrition, lifestyle, uh, even turning your phone off, all those habits build up the sum of what you do that also like flow into your work life, relationship, friendships, uh, everything. So. And because at the same time, your career is your career and it will end and you better have those other things or you will be lonely 
disappointed person at the end who spent all this time, you know, just worrying about your career, but everything else, where you live, your home, your wife, your, the choices with your kids. And if that stuff doesn't, isn't good, then it's, you need everything to be, you need to have the same passion about everything, not just about work, about all the choices that you make are, are, are so that, um, you know, it's what you care about. Yeah. Building a great foundation and kind of going off that. That's it's, you know, life throws you curveball curveballs all the time. You don't ever know where you're going to end up. And that's, you know, closing those doors. You know, I've met so many people that came out here to act or, you know, that's what they thought they wanted to do. Next thing you know, they are producing or there are writers now or, you know, directing or they went into a fully different, you know, I want to go into tech, I guess. hundred percent. Right? And that's what I tell kids. Like if I talk at USC, so I, once a year I go down to USC and talk at Annenberg and that's what I tell them. They're like, oh, how did you get started? I go, there is no place to get started. You just have to get started. And once you get in the game, you don't pigeonhole yourself into saying that I'm going to be an actor for the rest. You, you don't know where that's going to lead you. It could lead you to directing. It could, And you could find more reward in that. You don't know what your passion is going to be, especially at 21 years old. But your passion, if it's about the entertainment industry, the entertainment industry, like you said, now involves technology. So it, it's yeah. not just the entertainment industry. The entertainment industry is, is a lot more. And I find that sports is a part of it. And that's why I was able to make that transition to sports because I was, I was passionate about sports. So, um, you know, I was able to merge my skill set in Hollywood and how I cast to a TV show where we cast in a sporting event to make it feel real and authentic where people care about it. Um, and that's a decision in your taste that's made of something that you truly love. I love hearing that. Because it's it's based off the things you want to do, right? right? If so, even if they didn't pay me for it, I would do it. Right. I mean, I like doing it. It's something it. That everyone wants to see: is the yeah. matches that you lined up, Brady against Manning, Phil against Tiger. I mean, Bryson and Brooks. I mean, yeah. it's like people want to see that, right? And, and you're intrigued by it. Yeah, and and it's sort of like in, in today's day and age, I real I started to see how much networks were spending to buy media rights on leagues. And mm. I found a niche where we could produce it and control it and own it, but not be part of a league. It's hard to do. Uh, golf is the one sport because it had been done before with like the skins game and they had done some celebrity stuff in golf. It works in golf because golf, you can play in a handicap system. Anybody can play it. You can spend time talking to people. It's not like you're in basketball where you, you can't have a headset on somebody in basketball. Like they're not going to talk to you while they're running up and down the court. You're going to be huffing and puffing and breathing. So it's going to be hard to have that. Um, but you got to have good partners. Like it wouldn't have worked if we didn't have Charles Barkley or, you know, things happen that you got to get lucky upon too. Had I put this project potentially with ESPN in the beginning, it might not have worked as well had I done it at Turner. And I didn't know that. It's not like I said, oh, I need Charles Barkley to do this. It just, it just worked when I got with there and then we go with it. You never know what's going to work, but when you know there's a good idea, you got to be, you got to, you got to push the envelope on it. And, and the synergy of those ideas, right? It's like, obviously Charles loves golf. And Correct. so it's, you know, a passion for him as well. So it's, you bring a group of people together that are all like-minded and interested. And I also know that like people can play golf post their career. So like Tom yeah. Brady, for example, you know, can keep doing our thing and he has a great time with it. And he's building this autograph company and I'm making them potentially a sponsor on my next big event. And so I'm helping him out with projects that he's doing. And because we control that and are not stifled by Network, you know, regulations on a league, we're able to take chances and really help athletes build their brands and build their profile in in a way that's post career. So um, it's I'm, I'm really excited about the future of the match and where this is going, and it's it's really taken it's it's really a lot of fun. But that's about hanging around the rim. That's about being around show business because you never know what the one thing is that could take you to something that you love that also gives you a lot of financial reward as well. I personally could never do something just for money that I didn't like because I would have never had put the time and the effort every day of what it takes to get it off the ground if I didn't love it. So a lot of people can do that. I mean, a lot of people can start businesses and do things because they're, they're, but I am not wired like that. So 
you know, if I was wired like that, I would have gone to Israel for my bar mitzvah, not Hollywood. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it all comes back to how you were raised as a child and who you are as a child because we're really just children that have gotten older. Yeah. And so if you want to be successful in Hollywood or show business, whatever you call this entertainment, it's, it's holding on to your childlike passions because yep. that those are the stuff that you are most excited about and that's what people are going to feel when you're telling a story. Absolutely. Were you speaking of Brady uh, in that match when he made that shot from like 100, yeah. 150 yards out? I mean, how crazy was that? I was screaming. I was in a truck. You know, the pandemic had happened. That was actually the most incredible experience, you know, professionally that I've had in my life. Wow. Because remember, this is 2020 and there was nothing on. Sports were canceled. And I went to Jeff Zucker, who's an incredible executive uh, who was running Turner Sports and, and running CNN. And I said to Jeff, I think we have something that we need to do. And he's like, what, BZ? And I go, I think we need to put on the match and raise a lot of money for COVID and do this in a time where the country needs us. And he goes, all right, if you pull that off, you have, you know, you have our financial support. I was like, great. And he was the kind of guy who, once he said that, you were good. We didn't need contracts. You know, we, we just, you know... Knew we could figure this out. Obviously, you get into the contracts later. But that gave me the ability to go to my talent, get everybody lined up, you know, get Phil really excited, get Tiger excited. We, you know, Tom jumped on board very quickly. Peyton was there. But I did have them under contract for something that we were doing later in the year that we were doing had the pandemic not happened. So I was in business with these guys doing what I called Monday Night Golf with Peyton it was going to be Peyton and Tiger. It was the same match, but we were doing it on a Monday night, but it had nothing to do with the pandemic. When the pandemic happened, I thought we were going to get shut down and my whole deal was going to be over. So I went into like a one-day depression. And then, like I'm saying, I woke up early in the morning and started fighting to figure out how we could be one of the first sporting events up. And that just doesn't happen by like, oh, at three o'clock in the afternoon, you call somebody. That takes a lot of like figuring out and finagling and confidence because, you know, sponsors are nervous, talent's nervous. You know, we forget, you know, it was just two years ago, but people were in a crazy state of mind. Yes. And, you know, we pulled it off and we're the, the highest rated golf match in the history of television. Wow. And, it, you know, now it's taken our franchise to another level. And I'm ho hopefully, you know, we can have a, a, you know, a continued run with this because we give a lot of money back to charity and we have a good time for our celebrities and we really do a great job for the brands that support us. That's incredible. Whatever you do, uh, don't stop doing what you're doing. I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> it's awesome. Like, so this is something that uh, I'm actually kind of curious about. What was it like getting nominated for 12 Emmys? For Escape, Escape of Denimore? Yeah, yeah. That was incredible. Yeah. So Escape of Denimore, um, I was watching actually CNN. And I woke up and I was talking to a friend of mine. And he was like, this is an unbelievable story. What do you think? How long is it before we catch these guys? And I go, I don't know. We'll probably catch them tomorrow. And we just started getting in, in, engulfed in the story. At the time, I was producing Ray Donovan. So I went into the writer's room. Well, actually, I had two writers come to me and said they were unhappy with the current structure of who was running the show because Ann Bitterman had left and we had a new writer running the show and they had worked under the previous regime. And so they said to me, we're just not really thrilled. I think we're going to leave. And I said, okay, that's fine. But I want to do something else with you guys. So I said, this is an unbelievable story that just happened in the news. Let's figure this out. And I, you know, got them engaged. We started taking our lunch breaks and talking about Escape at Danamara every day. And so we developed a script while we were also doing Ray Donovan. Oh, and, wow. And then what happened was we, so, so we, they wrote the script on spec and then we went out to directors to uh, get with it. And, and my first instinct was actually Jodie Foster, weirdly enough. And so we sat, we got the script to Jodie Foster. We sat with her. She loved it because I kind of wanted her to potentially play the seamstress, the, the part that, um, weirdly, I wanted her to play the part that Patricia Arquette played. And we were thinking she could direct it and star in it in that part. And she decided that she just wanted to direct it. And so we were making deals with her. And then she was actually doing this George Clooney movie and they had problems on the movie 
And the head of the studio called her in and said, you need to shut everything down. We need to fix this movie. So she called us up and was like, look, I love this. I can't do it. And so once again, we were really bummed. We you know, lost somebody we thought was going to be unbelievable. And I ran into Ben Stiller's agent at lunch. And I was like, he was like, oh, Ben's looking for something direct. He doesn't want to act. I go, oh my God, I got this unbelievable thing. It happened literally that quickly. And he was like, and this is another testament to finding things where something is new because he was just getting back into directing and he had hired a new person to run his company looking for material. So this, so this is who I produced with this guy, Nikki Weinstock, just started at Red Hour. So we got the script to Nikki. Nikki loved it, let it, gave it to Ben, and we were off to the races. But had Nikki been there for four years, he would have been engulfed in four or five or six projects that he had been working on and, you know, you work on four or five of them and like one of them gets chosen, but you have to give so much attention to all that that it's very hard to bring a new child into, it's almost like starting a family. Like it, it's, right. it's like, it's hard. So, so, cause these things, you got to treat them like babies. I mean, they, they, you, they grow and you never know what they're going to grow into, but you really got to feed them and deal with them every day, especially, you know, in the beginning. And so that, that was a, you know, three year two to three year time period where we went from different director to the right director to getting it made and then casting it with uh, what I thought was an unbelievable cast and then getting the critical response that uh, I think, I think we deserved. I mean, you never know what's going to happen, but uh, that was a really, really special project and coming across, coming after Ray Donovan to then show that I could, you know, cause people always think, Oh, you can only do one thing and blah, blah, blah. And to go from Ray Donovan to Escape at Danamora in a, in a period of time really showed my strength as a, you know, as, as being able to get stuff done and do stuff with high quality. And uh, it opened a lot of doors for me and, and other avenues as well. That's incredible. I was thinking, uh, I'm just randomly thinking about a uh, stagecoach. I think that's where we first oh, yeah. ran into each other, right? Oh, was at it? The, I think it was at the pool. Probably, yeah. Unless or Coachella, maybe Coachella. Coachella is probably what it was, yeah. I do like weirdly going to Coachella because I do like walking around and seeing what young people are wearing and seeing what energy is there. Yeah. You know, because another thing as a producer is you can lose touch really e easily. And you, you constantly have to be, you know, going to things and doing stuff where you, you can tell what the tastes are. Um, and you know, Coachella is a convergence of whatever hipsters. And I know it sounds <laughs> ridiculous, but you know, you can learn from that. So I try and take, you know, group settings or concerts or anything I go to, to store it and learn and figure out, you know, how it could work to my advantage. Yeah. I feel that way with acting too. I mean, even just going to a coffee shop and watching somebody has a, the way they have the conversation on the phone, the way they hold the phone, the way, what are they talking about or what people are wearing, you know, it's. It's fascinating, but at the same time. It tells time, a story. Exactly. And all we yeah, are yeah. is storytellers. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. cool. That's what we do. Yeah, I feel like some people are forgetting that nowadays in terms of the storytelling, and but that's a whole other topic. Yeah, well, things have gotten <laughs> shorter, and we don't need to get it. Just no, no, no. So I have one more question sure. kind of going back or to earlier in your career. Sure. Um, in 2011, I believe, the yeah. details with Tobey yeah. Maguire. Yeah. So working with Toby at that stage in both your careers and seeing what has happened with him now with Spider-Man No Way Home. I mean, how do you think, I mean, you know, doing the interviews, having to lie, like contractually having to lie and then like going in and all that success. I mean, he seems like such a great guy. And like, Toby's awesome. You know, it's funny. When we did the details, he was in a negotiation to do the Spider-Man movie that he ended up not doing. Um, and him and Sam were kind of, I guess, I don't, I don't want to speak for what they were, but they ended up not doing that movie. He did this little movie with me and he actually gave an unbelievable performance. But that was a, a movie that Harvey Weinstein bought at Sundance for $9 million and we did the movie for $1.5 million. So it was actually an incredible success. <laughs> but it's Harvey and, you know, obviously, you know, he's, everyone knows what's happened to him. But he really, and I don't want to talk about somebody that, I am going to talk about somebody that's been horrible, but he was horrible. So we did a screening at Sundance and Toby was there, Elizabeth Banks was there and it was an unbelievable screening. We had an unbelievable ending. We had a very cool little movie. Harvey loved it. Harvey bought it and he paid an exorbitant amount for it. He ended up bringing the movie 
to New York and he showed it to like his little society friends in New York and they didn't like it. And, you know, he had promised like, oh, I'm going to get you an Oscar, Toby, this director. He was going to make a multi-picture deal with him. And he promised, promised us the world. And, you know, he paid for it, but, you know, he also didn't execute on what he was supposed to do after that. He literally made this director feel so bad about the movie that he made him change the entire ending. And he was so aggressive in how he did it. And he took over. And as a producer, I, I was just like, there's nothing I could do. I mean, I was steamrolled by a bully because he was controlling how the movie would get released. And he butchered the movie to pieces um, based on one screening. So it, it, was a, it, was a, it was a real learning experience. Um, I'm glad I watched what Harvey does because I, I was able to learn things that he was great at, but also things that were so disgusting that I would never do to people. Um, you know, if you want to buy something great, but don't lie to people. Don't overpromise if you can't deliver. And listen, he, he delivered on a lot of movies and his business model was buy 10 movies and one of them is going to go 100x and nine of them are going to be zeros. But the person who did this movie was a really talented writer-director, is a really talented writer-director, and he really, you know, hurt this guy's life. And I, I do think that's some of the reasons why things have happened to him the way he's happened to him. Because when things go bad, and you know, listen, I've had things happen in my life, not everything has been perfect, people have to stand by you. Because, you know, being a, out there, you're going to make decisions, and not all your decisions are going to be right. But as long as you do the right thing to people, people will stand up for you, um, you know, when you go through difficult times. Yeah. Definitely a, a cautionary tale for sure. I mean, I'm a huge believer in karma and just trying to keep positive energy in the world and trying to put out positive energy every day. And, you know. Um, yeah, that was something he, he did not do. Absolutely. And he has paid for it dearly. 100%. Um, and I think about the world he had at his oyster. I mean, he was literally like the king out here. And that's another thing to also remember that, you know, be with your family, be humble, do your work. And, you know, don't think you're too big because uh, it can come crashing down very quickly on you. Absolutely. Um, getting back to Toby. Sure. How yeah. do you think Toby Maguire handled, you know, that entire Spider-Man No Way Home situation? Great. Yeah, I mean, I think it's great for him. It's great for his kids to see him, you know, because he really was a superstar. He was the first sort of, you know, one of the first, you know, superstar comic guys. He was also a great actor. Yeah. Um, and so I think... Uh, He's a super smart guy. And Toby's going to have a long career, you know, as a producer, director, actor, whatever he wants to do, wherever he puts his mind to, he'll be successful. And I'm really happy that he's having a commercial resurgence because uh, he's a really hardworking guy. That's great to hear. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Do you, uh, going back to Todd Phillips, do you think there's going to be a, a Joker sequel? I do. Yeah. Oh, okay. Do. Todd, right. Todd is, uh, Todd is uh, I'm sure there will be. I mean, I can't say that for sure, but I, I would imagine there would be. What about Hangover? No, nah, I think maybe not for that's a while. On the, that's on yeah, the, yeah, that's yeah. the Joker I mean, would be Yeah, Joker amazing. would be sick. Yeah, he, he, he's probably the most brilliant guy I've worked with. That's awesome. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, to do people don't realize how hard it is to do comedy, like, and to do comedy on that level. Um, really, really hard. Harder than drama, actually. Because drama's on the page. You see it. It is what it is. You know, comedy to bring that energy to a set and make it work and then make people laugh in the theater is is, is freaking impossible. So the fact it, that, and to have that commercial success, right? It, the yeah. billion dollar franchise. Yeah. The, yeah. yeah, and to be able to do something for thirty million that can make a billion. I mean, you can't do that in, in other genres. Like if you're gonna do an action movie, you cannot do a thirty million dollar action movie. It's like right. um, you know, that's gonna make a billion. You you gotta spend 250, 300, 400, 500 million to make a billion. This is, is incredible what he's done. Uh, and he's done it time and time again. And he's yeah. done it since he was young. I mean, uh, and if you look at his body of work, he's, I mean, he's probably only done like eight or nine movies. But if you look at that, eight or nine movies and the box office total of those eight or nine movies is massive. Probably, probably a higher average uh, based on cost than any other uh, filmmaker in the world. That's... Incredible. People don't even realize that. People yeah. do not realize how powerful he is. You know why? Because he really takes his work seriously. He really cares about what he does, and he's really talented. All so right. it's a full combination. And he has great taste, um, and, and all his decisions 
down to a napkin on the set. I mean, there's, he doesn't he doesn't miss a beat when it comes to his eye. Yeah, I'm sure that's why you guys get along great, right? Yeah, I yeah. think so. Yeah. It's awesome. There you have it. Well, it's great spending yeah. time with you. Likewise, guys. This yeah, is thanks. Great. Thanks for coming on. Appreciate your time. Thanks for you know sharing everything you did with us. Great. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. hope you had fun with us. I love it. This is awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Premier. Yeah, right. All right, I hope man. I did well. Yeah, oh, you did great. You know, we're hoping we did well. You know, <laughs> all right, great. All right, awesome. Thank you. Thank Absolutely. You. Thank you, Beasley. Thanks for tuning in to Studio Twenty Two.